Uh, Hello, Mimi, everyone. do you hear? Yes. Um, I did hear a little bit more feedback, Mimi. Not sure if it's gone away just yet. Um, I think it should be okay now. Sorry, okay. everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for our webinar, Is Your Wardrobe Affecting Your Pay? Presented by K.L. Moore. My name is Mimi Kim with Ivy Exec. Before I introduce our presenter, K.L. Moore, I'd like to quickly go over a few logistical items to make sure our webinar runs as smoothly as possible. We will be recording the webinar and we'll send you a link to a stream of the recording as a follow-up. For the audio for today's webinar, you'll notice that you have two options. You can use either the voice over IP option or dial in directly with the number provided in your registration email. If you have any trouble with your audio during the webinar, uh, send us a quick note through the questions tab. We've muted everyone this evening to ensure good sound quality. At any point, should you have any questions for Kale, you'll see the questions tab on our control panel, and you can send them to me directly. I'll be happy to share the questions with Kale at the end of the webinar. We will also have a few interactive poll questions during the webinar so that Kale can get a better understanding of who is on the call and through that, tailor what you present. Please be sure to provide your input to these poll questions. Now on to our presenter. Kale Moore, MBA, is a professional image consultant and seminar leader who teaches business owners and professionals how to tailor their visual image for business success. As a former electrical engineer and prior boutique owner, she infuses her corporate experience with her fashion expertise to help clients understand the link between personal appearance, and financial success. She shares first-hand knowledge of how to convey the right message through attire at any weight, shape, or height. Her business, KL Image Group, is a professional image consulting firm which specializes in corporate training, seminars, and individual consultations. Please welcome KL Moore. Thanks so much, Mimi, for hosting me on today. And I want to personally thank Ivy Exec for allowing me to share this topic with you, the listeners. You know, I spent the early part of my career as an electrical engineer in manufacturing for a biotech company. No, I didn't dress the way I do these days uh, because I worked at a plant in which I had to wear a hard hat, still toe shoes, and safety glasses. I worked with an array of people who had pretty much every qualification for success. They were educated, hardworking, dedicated, and very competent and technically astute. But somehow, they didn't get the key assignments, recognition, or promotions they thought they so richly deserved. They were convinced that as long as they did a good job, dressed sensibly, and stayed out of harm's way, they were bound to move ahead. This was far from reality. Now, today, as an image consultant, when I work with clients one-on-one, -on -one, they all have one common goal. They all tell me that they want to look more well put together and that they want a wardrobe that will spruce up their image and pretty much they want to feel more confident because in essence when you look good you feel great. Yes, clothing certainly can change how you look and how you feel about yourself inside but it also tells others how to feel about you, how to treat you and eventually the look good, feel great message translates into more money in your pocket. So on today, here's what I plan to share with you. First of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about the relevance of Im image. Um, I'll go a little bit into business casual, how it sort of differs from business appropriate, although that's a totally different webinar that I offer. So we'll just kind of scratch the surface on that today. I'll also talk about the secrets of well-dressed professionals, why people desire to look tall, what your hairstyle says about you, and a couple of image updates that yield the highest returns. Now, you may be shocked to learn that image is actually a tangible asset. Its impact has been measured by countless of researchers in the past. And when you look specifically at wardrobe, here's the stats for you. 63% of senior execs agree that employees who wear more professional attire do advance faster in their careers. You see, they're actually hired quicker, promoted faster, agreed with more often. 
and they receive preferential treatment relative to their ill-dressed peers. And because of their more refined wardrobe, these people also appear more attractive than their competition. Now, when I talk about attractiveness, you may be thinking more so along the lines of beauty. No, attractiveness is totally different from beauty. Beauty gets into the symmetry of the face and the size of the eyes and the lips and the bone structure. I'm talking about attractiveness. Attractiveness is simply defined as two things, being in good health as number one. That means you have the appearance of being really young and energetic or looking younger than you actually are. And two, being well put together. So again, attractiveness is one, having the appearance of being in good health and two, having the appearance of being well put together. So you can work to make yourself appear more attractive via wardrobe, hairstyle, makeup, weight, body language, all of those things. Now, let's take a look at how image actually impacts the money you make. As I mentioned, image is a tangible asset. And yes, it certainly can impact the bottom line. What they found is actually both men and women benefit from having a more refined appearance. Well-dressed men and women both earn up to even a 15% difference than their peers. And then when you look at what's called a penalty for plainness, let me, let me sort of explain that to you. Well-dressed men and women range on average, say, 5% above those that have a sloppy, plain, or unfashionable appearance. Now, the penalty for sort of appearing plain, okay, you wear khakis and a white docker, you wear khakis and a white polo shirt to work every day. You know, you just have a really basic appearance. The, the penalty for plainness is 9%. That far exceeds any premium for beauty or being handsome. So if you do nothing to refine your image, you have the potential to lose 9% of your income. But if you make even the slightest change, you have the potential to gain about 5%. Please note that the consequence for doing nothing to your image, if you need to, far exceeds the benefits for doing just a very little to enhance it. We've also found that women in corporate should avoid appearing too attractive. So remember, again, it's just the small things that sort of give your image a boost. We don't want, um, well actually, when you talk about beautiful women in corporate, there's actually more of a backlash because there's a harder chance of sort of gaining respect and credibility. So it's just a matter of sort of taking your image up just a notch so that you're a little bit above average. Oh, I love these stats. Attractive women in particular, 20% more likely to be hired by another woman and three times more likely to be offered a job by a man. And I'd say dressing up, sprucing up the wardrobe is well worth it. Now who does image matter most to? Matters most to women, minorities, managers, men that are, well I like to say vertically challenged or men that are under 5'10", people who deal with relative strangers as a core part of their job, and salespersons. People who image matter least to would be those that are really, really extremely powerful or uniquely talented or immensely wealthy. For those few people who are so talented, powerful, and wealthy that, that dress doesn't affect them, you typically find that no matter how successful they are, they would have actually moved up faster and made more, long, more money along the way had they dressed more effectively. Now, how does this all work together? What is it about your image that sort of leads back into more money in your pocket? Let me share with you how this, I sort of call it the workplace success cycle sort of works. If you start up at the top of the cycle here where it says more refined image, what happens if you do just a little bit to sort of take your image to a new level? Well, something called the attraction factor, really, that's what sort of draws people to you and then sort of gives you what we consider to be more favorable treatment. So people 
allow you to, um, you know, they, they deliver things to you quickly, more quickly than others. Um, they finish the, pro the uh, project uh, more efficiently because you're the leader. They want to do things to really help you out, right? And then after that, what we see is you yourself, you start to notice that, and your self-esteem starts to get a boost, okay? And then now you're feeling better, and it's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy, of course, that you become more confident. And of course, more confidence allows us to be more mobile socially. So we're more willing when we're out there networking socially, we go up to people, we speak to them, we start the conversation, we sort of facilitate uh, dialogue between others, whereas before maybe you were a bit shy and you weren't as willing to sort of go up to people to start an initial conversation. So, of course, there's more social networking, and then we find, of course, we all know that some of the best jobs come through networking, so we find that there's also more opportunity for success. More people know who you are, um, your, your, your group of, of, of um, people that are important to you and that who know who you are and that can do things for you, that group expands. And so from there, we start to experience what's called the higher the handsome and beauty premiums that sort of lead into, of course, making more money. So because you have more opportunity for success, yes, definitely you make more money. And what does make, making more money do? Of course, it allows you to have a more refined image and sort of a cycle. So now you have more money to, to put as it to, puts, excuse me, to put or to invest into your image, okay? To buy more clothes, to make sure that your grooming is up to par on a regular basis. All those things, of course, come from the ability to make more money. So why is it that so many people, 67% of people, are surprised by how others perceive them? I believe because most people, a lot of t the times, we typically don't know when it comes to attire. Most people have no idea that their dress is negatively affecting their career. It's not always easy to know because, you know, image or having a poor image is sort of like having bad breath or I call, call it or having spinach in your teeth, right? People are not quite as likely to tell you when you're dressed inappropriately. Now, your image is made up of a number of different elements. Some you carefully cultivate and others you might not even be aware of. So if you want to know if your in image is working or not, the best way to do that is to sort of notice how others react to you. You know, ask yourself, do people assume that you're a lot older than what you really are? Do they appear to take you seriously? Do they dismiss or engage in your conversation? Oh, here's one. Are strangers surprised when you tell them what you do for a living? So those are the types of things that you can ask yourself to sort of do a self-check to see if your image is up to par. And most of all, I always like to say, ask yourself in what you're wearing, would I ask for a raise in what I'm wearing at this very moment? So let's talk about some of those faux pas that we make on a regular basis. What is considered to be too casual? Okay, Here are a couple of uh, very common business casual faux pas that we see in the workplace. Wearing denim, sneakers, you know, the sagging pants. For ladies, it would be capri pants, sleeveless tops, mules. That would be the sandals that she has on and of course athletic wear. You know, I think it's interesting um, if you look at some of the polls when they asked execs what are, what are some of the things that they wanted to see change when it came to workplace attire. The number one thing that bosses complained about was wearing jeans. They said they wanted to totally eliminate uh, the use or the, the wearing of jeans in the workplace. The other complaints came from execs. Uh, they said they didn't want to see sweats or shorts or capri pants. And you can see that the lady in the middle has on capri pants. Here's some other business casual faux pas that we tend to make. Um, sundresses, no, they're great for the weekend, but not quite appropriate for the workplace. <coughs> Excuse me. Of course, mini skirts showing cleavage and sexy sandals, that won't do either. 
And for men, the facial hair is inappropriate for business casual as well. And last but not least, of course, tats and piercings, need I say more? Um, this is definitely one area that most uh, professional executives tend to complain about. They don't like the idea of tats and piercings in the workplace. And I do highly recommend that if you are considering getting a uh, any type of body art, you may want to do it in an area where it's going to be concealed. But my message here today, it's not so much about some of those very, very common faux pas that we see. Today I want to talk a little bit more about what I consider missing the mark. Um, many of you here on the phone uh, with me or on the session with me, chances are uh, you are probably really serious, career-minded people, and you maybe perhaps you've even made it to middle management level. So you're typically not the offenders of those faux pas we just discussed, but this is more about refinement, and let me share with you what I mean. For example, let's take a look at what's right or wrong with these looks. Well, if you look at the lady on the left, I'm going to go from left to right. Not only is her cleavage showing, but if you notice, her jacket, her sleeves are too long. This is one of those details that really, really comes into fit um, relative to our attire that really makes us look more polished. The next gentleman, of course, he looks much neater than the, the other one that I showed earlier with the denim on, but denim is still inappropriate for business casual. It is appropriate for casual, but not business casual. So although he looks really neat, he's still missing the mark. The young lady in the khaki suit, well, her suit is totally too big. It's oversized. It just looks really, really slouchy. And uh, again, her sleeves are too long. And just it's, it's too big throughout the, the, uh, throughout the suit. <clears throat> the guy on the right, well, you know, if you look at him at first glance, you might think, what, well, what's wrong with him? Well, the problem here is that this is much more of a relaxed look, great for weekend, almost sort of gives you a little bit of a Hawaiian feel or so, but probably not ideal for the workplace. Again, we're talking about the ability to refine our look. Okay, moving on. Okay, what happened here? Okay, having a little bit of problems advancing the slides here. Let's see. Kale, you may want to end the slideshow and then restart it. Yes. Okay. Maybe with the right click. Yeah. Do I have to totally go out and come back in, or can I just start here? Uh, you should be able to start with that slide. Okay. There we go. Thank you. Perfect. We're back on and moving again. So taking a look here, again, what's right or wrong with her look on the left here. She has on mules. The skirt is a little bit short. The second gentleman, well, he hasn't tucked in his shirt tail, so that's a very casual look. The next lady with the blue sweater on, she's wearing sleeveless, although she looks very neat, um, still inappropriate and slightly missing the mark. And then the gentleman on the right, not only is the hairstyle probably not appropriate, but if you take a look down at the bottom, he has on a really sort of an industrial type feel, uh, really the, the uh, bulky shoe with white socks, which is a total, total no-no. Okay. He's still having problems advancing the slides. Mimi, any suggestions? Do I, do I have to keep? You shouldn't have to. Um, could you try doing that again, exiting out, and or even just right-click and go to the next slide? OK. OK, moving on. The gentleman on the left, well, he's wearing short sleeve. And for you men that are joining me on today, if you're going to wear a short sleeve t-shirt, you definitely need to have a jacket on top. The lady standing next to him, the problem with her 
outfit is that she actually has her sleeves are showing uh, extending beyond her jacket. And for those of you ladies who may not realize it, that is not the proper look for women when you talk about proper sleeve length fit. Um, our sleeves should not extend beyond the jacket. And conversely, if you look at the gentleman standing next to her, the problem with his outfit is that his sleeves should extend about, uh, about a quarter or a half inch uh, beyond his jacket. So guys, yes, you do want the sleeves showing beyond the jacket. Women, no, no sleeves showing beyond the jacket. And then last but not least, the gentleman on the right, he had, has on a short sleeve shirt with a tie. And for those of you who may not realize, that's also a no-no. If you're definitely going to be wearing um, a tie in the workplace, um, long sleeve definitely is the way to go. Okay? So let's take a quick look at the difference between business casual and business appropriate because, you know, I like to think of it as it's the style that gets you into middle management, which is sort of high authority. It typically won't take you to the top. So the rules start to sort of change for those of you that are sort of starting to think about C-level positions or really getting into the executive suite or continue to move up the ladder. So I want to sort of just define what business casual is. Business casual is pretty much uh, coordinated bottoms and tops. Um, you know, for ladies that could be a pair of slacks or a skirt and a matching top, and for the gentlemen, um, slacks or khakis with a matching top as well. It could be collared or non-collared. And for business appropriate, I want you to think that it's more of a layered look. If you notice here, everyone has on a jacket. If you are moving into management or if you are into management, I highly recommend that you consider business appropriate even if your um, dress code policy for your company uh, states that you're only required to wear business casual. You may want to seriously think about um, being suited in business appropriate instead. So very quickly, some business casual guidelines for men and women. This is all about dressing one notch above what your peers, clients, what your employees are doing. So you always want to be just a hair above those around you. Um, so, for example, dressing more formally than your peers, one notch up from your clients, and more refined than your employees. Dressing better, of course, than the competition, and looking more polished than your audience, particularly if you are presenting. Women, in particular, I want you to make sure that you wear a jacket or carry one with you. Choose dark colors as core pieces. What I mean by that, that would be your slacks and your jacket and then you can do your accent colors underneath as an underpinning. Wearing heels are essential unless you have some type of physical challenge that would make it highly uncomfortable for you to do so. Wearing heels immediately changes your posture, gives you more presence and authority simply by the way uh, you walk and carry yourself as a result of wearing heels. Of course, you want to stay away from the lace, frilly, floral prints, drapey fabrics, and Definitely, ladies, you, you really want to look at wearing understated makeup. Um, that's really one of the things that will help take you to the next level if you're looking at refining your image. So what is it that well-dressed professionals do? If you look at folks that have been really successful of sort of moving through the ranks and also having a great appearance, what is it that they have mastered uh, that other people tend not to do. First of all, these people understand their colors. They understand how to wear what's called their wow colors. You want to wear wow colors as accents in accessories such as scarves, tops, and handbags. As you can see, my client here on the left, when I first started working with her, um, the color that she has on versus the color that um, I put her in when I did her makeover, you can see that her eyes immediately pop and just you automatically notice the difference in her image. Much more polished, much more pleasing to the eye, just absolutely stunning after the makeover. And what about men? Same thing here. You can wear accent colors in your shirt and ties, specifically 
on days that you have um, certain goals, certain things that you want to accomplish, um, because colors do carry certain meanings. And I'm going to go over that just a little bit uh, as we move forward. But you can see here on the left in his before picture, he has on basic black and white, but just looks a little bit more stylish and more polished in the black and the lavender color on the right. Now, I briefly mentioned this whole idea of colors have different meanings. I don't have time on this webinar to go into each one of these colors, but in general, you can use color to exude certain meanings to your audience. You can use color to either look more authoritative or more approachable. So for example, dark neutrals, meaning black, navy, charcoal, those are the colors that represent power and authority. You appear very conservative and formal in those colors. If you think about some of the most highly respected positions, positions of authority and power in society, that would be uh, positions such as law enforcement, so policemen. You think of priests. You think of nuns. Um, you think of judges. They wear black, navy, charcoal colors. These are the colors that, again, represent power and authority. And then you move down a notch to the light neutrals. These are what I like to call the networking colors that you want to wear when you want to blend into a crowd really easily. So you would wear these colors as your core suiting. Um, but if you want to be noticed in the crowd, underneath that, those basic colored light neutral colors for your suit or for your bottoms, you might want to pop a little bit of what I call the, the attention getters the red, the bright turk, the hot pink, these are the colors that you wear when you do want to be noticed or you do want to stand out in a crowd. Now you may be thinking, of course, I don't want to wear a hot pink jacket. That's totally okay. What I'm suggesting is that you would be wearing these colors more as accents in small areas on the body. So maybe as a scarf or maybe uh, very subtle parts of a print that would be um, in, the, in the blouse or in the shirt that you're wearing. Pastel colors, of course, represent femininity and gentleness. They appear open and inviting. So let's say, for example, if we have a, a um, really tall CEO male with a very strong presence, and let's say he's going out to the community. He's going to be presenting to a group of, let's say, a mommy and me group. Okay? He's going out in the community. He's going to be talking about his company. and chances are he's going to want to relax his look a bit. Maybe he's been suited from uh, his events prior in the day, but if he had planned properly, what he might have wanted to have done is to wear a black suit or a navy suit and to pop one of these pastel color shirts underneath would be great in terms of sort of softening his appearance and making him appear much more approachable to a group of females who are all mothers. So let's test our knowledge about colors. We're going to do the first, very first poll question. This is poll question number one. And it is about whether or not you know when you're building a wardrobe which color suit you should purchase first. Should it be black, which is A? Should it be gray or charcoal gray, B? What about navy, C, and D, brown? Um, I'm going to give Mimi a chance to put the poll question up, but I'm going to repeat it just one more time. When you are building a wardrobe, which color suit should you purchase first, black, charcoal, navy, or brown? Okay, Mo Mimi, you can go ahead and put the question up for me, please. Thank you. I'm going to give everyone just a few more moment, moments to chime in. All right, it looks like the majority of people believe that it's black. It's actually split a little bit between black and navy. 43% say black, 38% say navy. Um, the rest of the people say charcoal gray, and no one has selected brown. Perfect, wonderful. Okay, here's the deal, ladies and gentlemen. The deal with black is black is probably not the number one suit that you want to buy. It's actually navy, and here's the reason why. Black is so formal that it can, in some cases, not be quite as versatile. However, navy, you still get the same results. It's formal. It's authoritative. Um, 
it's uh, credible as well, but it's not quite as formal as black. So you'll get a little bit more wear and tear and a little bit more versatility out of that navy suit if you invest in that first, as well as, man, if you're going to be buying a blazer, um, definitely this is the number one color you want to buy first as well. So pretty good. I'm, I'm glad to see that there were more people voting for navy um, just as about as much as black. So that sounds good. Okay. Now, I was sharing with you earlier about well-dressed professionals. What do they do well that some other people don't quite get? What is it about them that really makes them stand out in the crowd in the workplace? And I mentioned to you is that they know how to wear their colors. That's number one, colors. They do understand the message and meaning behind color. Well, the other thing that they understand is fit. When you really look at someone who's dressed well, Wow, it's like their fit is right on T. You know, their clothes fit them perfectly. It's like they were made just for them. So color, fit, and then eventually we're going to get to the third thing that well-dressed professionals do very well, and that is style, determining the best style for them as well. So now we're going to test your knowledge as it relates to fit. And this one is for women only. And then, guys, I'm going to come back, and, and I have a poll question for you as well. So the question is, which hem length is correct? Is it A or is it B? For women only, which hem length is correct? Is it A or is it B? Mimi, you may put the poll question up. I'm going to give uh, everyone just a few more moments to chime in. It seems that the majority of the people believe that picture A is correct. Actually, picture B is correct, ladies. And the reason why B is correct is because what you have here is called a break. This little, uh, hopefully you can see my cursor here, but this little piece of fabric here is called a break. And that is what you want your slacks to do when you're having them hemmed. Your slacks should actually come about halfway down on the heel here rather than stopping at the base of the heel. And what this helps to do, it helps to elongate your look, and it doesn't make you look quite as choppy. It doesn't break your look as much. And you'll see another picture of that, ladies, in just a moment. By the way, men, this applies to you as well. Your slacks should be hemmed with a break as well. Very same thing. And ladies, you can see here exactly what I'm talking about. The photo on the left, the slacks are actually too short. You can see her foot is exposed, and it just sort of looks choppy. She doesn't look, it, it breaks up her nice, clean look that she has on the second picture. You see that picture, or the photo on the right, her slacks are hemmed with a break. You see the soft band here? Okay, that's called the break. Nice, long even, and again, we don't have that uh, breaking consistency here, so she just looks absolutely more lean and slim, okay? Okay, man, this one's for you. Poll question number three, men only. Which jacket and shirt collar fit is correct? Because again, remember, we're talking about refining our image, um, and give them a couple of minutes, Mimi, while I'm so I'm going to elaborate a little bit. But we're talking about refining our image, going to the next level, making sure that we understand color, fit, and style. So perhaps it may seem a little bit trivial, but it's actually something that's really important to men when you're wearing a jacket with your shirt because this shows your knowledge of dress and attire. It shows whether or not you understand how to buy a suit or how to buy a jacket. And it also acknowledges your level of details. So which jacket and shirt collar fit is correct? Is it A, B, C, or D? Mimi, you can put the poll question up. I'm going to give everyone just a few more minutes or moments. Seems that most of the people believe that it's picture D. Excellent. Picture D is correct. The problem with picture A is that the jacket extends too far from uh, the shirt collar, 
Uh, picture B, there's not enough shirt collars showing. Picture C, there's too much shirt, uh, too much of the collars showing. And picture D is just perfect. You are correct. Very good job, men. Very good job. Okay. So one half inch of shirt collar should be visible above the jacket collar. Excellent. Okay. Now, again, sort of reiterating color fit style for well-dressed professionals. Now we're moving on to style. Remember to select the right style of clothes for your body, age, and personality. So here are some questions that you probably want to ask yourself. Does your clothing look age appropriate? For example, the lady on the left, she appears outdated. She's in business casual. Absolutely. She's definitely in business casual. So I like to always say the fashion police definitely will not arrest her, right? <laughs> but she, at the same time, she appears a bit outdated. While the lady on the right, she looks current. Okay, she has on a, you know, a red shirt, but it's also the style and the difference of her skirt. Okay, more fitted, not as much of the floral print there, and uh, just a much better style. Same here. Let's take a look at his before and after. Okay, in this case. He probably looks too trendy on the left in his before photo versus much more polished and much more well put together on the right in his after photo. So selecting the appropriate style is key. And also note that he has on an undershirt underneath um, his shirt as well. That's a must. Once again, selecting appropriate style before she uh, has on something that really is oversized, outdated. She did not lose not one ounce in terms of weight. It's just simply by understanding her body and purchasing uh, garments that uh, fit her body according um, uh, best according to her body. Okay, so much more of a sleek look, and she just looks totally just knocked off a couple of years in terms of age. So again, color, fit, and style. Now, what is it about this whole height thing? Why is it, why do we want to appear taller? Me, myself, I'm only 5'1", so believe you me, I do practice this uh, very much so. Ladies, I think I mentioned to you that it's, it definitely makes a difference in terms of wearing heels, but not just for women, but for men uh, as well. Have you ever wondered why we're always trying to create the illusion of height? Um, you know, more than half of the CEOs in American Fortune 500 companies, they're actually six feet or taller, whereas the average height of the American male is only five foot nine inches. And then when you think about the presidents of the United States, since, what is it, since 1776, I think it is, only two to three presidents have been below average height. And they say that the easiest way to predict the winner in a U.S. election is to be the taller man. Wow. I'd say height is pretty important. Okay, but there's actually, there's this unconscious association of power and status that's directly correlated with height. Uh, so height, although it's not as significant for women, it has a tremendous impact on men. Uh, and in general, taller people make more money, they have, they're perceived to be more powerful, and they are also perceived to have higher social status in life as well. So um, we know that all of those things are not necessarily true. We know that people that are tall aren't necessarily more powerful, but it's simply the illusion that our mind associates with height. So here are a couple of what I call tall tips for women, things that you can do if you want to sort of create the illusion of height. The first one on the left is what I call mon uh, monochromatic colors on the outside. If you notice, She's wearing the same color, that's what monochromatic means, same color that's sort of um, going up on the outside of her outfit. So the outline of the jacket as well as the slacks, whereas on the inside she's popping color. If you do the reverse, if you're wearing, um, if you mix and you put uh, the white jacket on the outside and a black shirt on the inside, that would not be as slimming or would not give as much of the illusion of height. Also vertical stripes and not wearing cuffs, okay, those are things that make us appear taller. Uh, V-neck, 
the lady in the, let in the middle, wearing a V-neck, having a crease in your slacks, wearing square toe or pointed, pointed toe shoes, and last but not least, the lady on the right, um, wearing a single-breasted jacket that gives you a visible, a visible column of buttons right down the middle. And she also has on a pencil skirt, which um, helps to elongate the body. And for men, here are a couple of tall tips for you. Of course, vertical stripes, non-bulky square toe shoes, so none of those work boot type shoes, monochromatic colors, um, looking at the gentleman in the middle, and um, short haircuts uh, and creased slacks, having a crease in your slacks down in the middle. Anything you can do to sort of create that line, a vertical line on your body, sort of gives you more height. Uh, wearing a skinny tie and slacks, of course, hemmed with a break. So if you're wearing your pants too short, immediately that makes you look shorter. And what does your hairstyle reveal about you? Okay, what is it? We're talking about style here. Remember color fit style? So we've talked about, uh, you know, style as it relates to the style of clothing that you choose for yourself. But what about hairstyles? Let's just take a look at that real quickly. Um, ladies, very quickly, from left to right, longer hair is considered to be um, not, as, um, not as powerful of a look. Um, once you, you think about the, the young lady in the top left corner, the thought behind extremely long hair is that this is sort of the college girl look. This is w the way you looked when you left college. Now, of course, we know that this is these are only perceptions that people put with certain looks. This is not necessarily always true, but sort of subconsciously what we sometimes think. Okay, if you're wearing very curly, flowy hair, sort of a romantic style, you're considered to be much more feminine and um, certainly um, gives you, probably um, doesn't give as much of a powerful look as what they consider mid-length hair, mid to short-length hair. So the lady on the right, she has mid-length hair, and then these, the next two ladies on the bottom in the green, the light green on the bottom end here, and also the lady with the short hair here with the melon color shirt on. So mid to short-length hair is perceived to be much more effective as it relates to women, particular as women um, age as well. Now the lady, the African American lady in the bottom with the green on, the green background, that's much more eclectic and fun. She would be much more appropriate for some artsy or creative type role. And then last but not least, I wanted to put in here um, someone who has, is a little bit more seasoned and she started to gray. Um, because gray hair for women is totally different uh, for as it relates to gray hair for men in the workplace. Uh, it's sort of a twofold for a man that's graying. The, a, a male that has gray hair, people assume, one, that he's not quite as energetic, but they also assume that he may be more mature or more reliable. But a woman, when she starts to gray, unfortunately, it's sort of perceived as she's from somewhat over the hill. But I always recommend once you start to get to a point where um, it's, it sort of becomes hard to keep dyeing your hair, I believe that it certainly works in your favor to go ahead and allow it to gray because it just becomes much more of a hassle and not quite as appealing when, when you're having to um, sort of cover up gray on a weekly basis. So if I have any of my folks on here that are sort of dealing with that, um, that would be a little bit of feedback there. And then, of course, hairstyles, looking at the same thing for men, having longer hair that's uh, more with more relaxed curls in it, that's more of a romantic look, says he's much more approachable, much more friendly. As we move from left to right, we short, sort of get into the shortcuts, which are um, tend to be perceived as much more authoritative looks. And then down at the bottom, we have our fun, creative guy down in the bottom left corner who, of course, if he's uh, looking at a more engaging role that where you need to be creative, something in terms of acting or, 
or something where he really needs to be a people person, real fun, real creative, that would be appropriate. And then the last two gentlemen, um, again, the one on the end, again, we already talked about graying for men, and the gentleman that the hairline is starting to recede here, um, I always recommend that at some point it's just better once you go ahead and allow the hair to, um, you can go ahead and get it cut and go bald. It works much better in most cases once the hair gets to a certain point in terms of receding. Okay. So again, talking about size and, and really understanding the difference of how people perceive us, whether or not we are a male or a female. We talked about some of those differences as it relates to gray hair. We also talked about height as it differs for men versus women. And now I want to talk a little bit about weight gain for men versus women. Um, you know, for women, this is much more of a challenge as we start to gain weight. Um, the immediate notion is to sort of cover up and we want to wear, you know, sort of put on more fabric to hide the weight uh, because we're sort of dealing with, we're not w really where we want to be. We're sort of working through that process to perhaps lose the weight. And here, here is my suggestion. Um, I really don't recommend oversizing women because here's what happens. If you look at this client, um, and by the way, if you see the tub in the back, this is because when I go out and I do closets, that's usually one of the first things I do when I'm doing uh, makeovers. And um, I have people try on key pieces in their wardrobe, and that's what she's doing. And so we're standing in front of the mirror in the bathroom, and so that's why you see the, the, all the tile and the tub in the background. So, But at any rate, I want you to take a look at her left arm and her right arm. And what I've done here, because she's wearing these really oversized pieces, I've actually pinned her left arm. I've pinned the excess fabric. And you can see how much more slimming it would be if she would not have worn something with such excess uh, fabric on it. Versus her right hand, you can, or her right arm, you can see this is the nat natural state of the garment. And she's simply adding more weight. But again, look at the left arm that I've pinned there. I pinned the extra fabric, and it's just much more slimming. So I want to caution you um, to sort of stay away from oversizing when you're going through that mode. Um, you don't want to wear clothes that are tight, but sometimes it's better to go with clo clothing that's slightly fitted. And then here, conversely, this is a situation with a client um, where she's kind of going through some weight challenges and sort of denying the weight gain. So the jacket is too small. And here's my recommendation here. Uh, you know, you start to notice that the clothing, you're having challenges button, buttoning the jackets and different things like that. My recommendation is just, just to simply allow the jacket to stay open. It would have been much better. But by her buttoning the middle button there, she is bringing, a, bringing attention to the fact that the jacket is actually too small. So um, in her after photo, you can see, yes, she does look more sleek, um, but she did go through a weight loss program. Um, that was her personal desire. Uh, I, I, I believe personally that uh, m most people can look great at any weight, shape, of high or height as long as you understand how to dress your body. But that was her choice. She did want to um, lose a couple of pounds and you can just see that uh, here she looks much more sleek in terms of her after photo. So where do you go from here? So far, we've talked about you know, understanding that as you move up the ranks, you're going to need to take it up a notch. It's all about refining your look, making sure that you understand how to be a well-dressed professional. You understand what colors work best on you. You understand the proper fit for garments. And you also understand what styles work best for your body. So which image updates, if you were thinking about refining your image, which updates yield the highest returns? What is it or where do you want to invest your money? Here are a couple of what I call low-cost image boosters that you can do relatively quickly. Number one, get a new hairstyle. Two, update your eyewear. Three, adjust or add some color. And women, of course, um, starting to wear, you should start to wear makeup. 
But the whole concept, if you look at all four of these, is focused around the face. face. And what I want you to do, if you're considering refining your image, just simply start with what you do with the face. Refining your, or excuse me, not refining, but framing your face with the right color. So color comes free. You know, when you're out there selecting between different shirts or different blouses, most of the time you get to pick which color that you want to buy. And it's just a matter of understanding what, what's your color. And wearing colors that are inherent to your body, wow, it just makes a difference. Those are the colors that when you wear them, people say to you, wow, that color really looks great on you today. Or, wow, you, look, you just look, it's something about you today that makes you, you look different. You look livelier versus on the days when you're wearing colors that don't work for you. Well, somebody, someone may even walk up to you and, and ask you, you know, do you feel okay today? Are you okay? Because believe it or not, wearing the wrong colors actually <clears throat> can make you look sallow, make the skin look sallow, and kind of give you an uh, ill feeling as well. So again, getting a new hairstyle, updating your eyewear, adding color and makeup. So let's take a look at eyewear. You can see this gentleman here. He has on a pair of eyewear um, that sort of works for his face. Um, this is a, a sort of a um, rectangular look because what you're doing, you're always going to be matching your eyewear relative to your face shape. That's the number one thing you want to do. So example, if you have a really round face, you don't want to buy really round or oval shaped eyewear. It's going to magnify the roundness in your face. So for example, this client here in her before photo, she has on a really outdated uh, rim and what I've done is, you know, given her a little bit, I call it a funky frame, you know. Um, she has on a rectangular shape that sort of balances off her face as well. Same thing here. This client at the time of her makeover was 62, and she had on the wire rim eyewear, and um, I sort of updated her eyewear to give her a little, I call it a little, modest bling on the side, but it's very subtle, so it's still appropriate for the workplace. Okay. Um, of course, ladies, wearing makeup is essential. You can see here <clears throat> the power of, of uh, makeup, and uh, no, her before and after is not staged. That's simply the difference in, in uh, wearing makeup and getting a new hairdo. Same thing here, by the way. Uh, makeup is huge, and, and if you are someone, you need to look more mature. This uh, young lady has a very uh, young look, and because she works primarily with men who are twice her age, you can see she certainly looks much more mature once she has on the appropriate makeup. Okay? And what about that haircut? Remember I talked about getting a new hairdo? Okay? Remember, if you change your hair color alone, let's say if you're getting your hair color changed, I want you to remember not to go so far that it creates sort of a conflict with your brows. You can see the gentleman here, his hair has been dyed blonde, but he has dark brown brows, and it really, there's sort of a conflict there that's going on, okay? So always remember that when you're, um, there are ways to have your brows dyed as well, but in this case, of course, blonde, blow, blonde brows wouldn't work on him, but it's just a matter of his hair has probably been dyed too light. Okay. Another thing with hair, sometimes it's just a matter of adjusting the temperature. Um, you can see this client, uh, sh her hair was just too blonde, and it was, it's really conflicting with her skin tone. But uh, what I've done here is given her more of an ash blonde, which is much, much better, much appeal more, more appealing relative to her skin tone. So you can also work on simply adjusting the temperature of your hair coloring. Highlights are always a winner and, and not quite that expensive. Um, so we've, I've worked with the stylist to give her highlights as well as uh, soften her look. If you notice, her face is very square-shaped, 
And so I wanted to soften the squareness of her face, so I wanted her to have some bangs. Uh, she's very uh, carefree, free-going, so we didn't want to do anything really, uh, well, we wanted something that was hassle-free, and that's exactly what she got here, something very, very easy to take care of and hassle-free, okay? And last but not least, of course, simply by, I call it taming the mane. And so in this case, it was just a matter of sort of putting her hairstyle up in a more um, presentable fashion for the workplace as well. So that's her before and after. Okay. So I'm, I'm just about at a close here on today. And um, I want to encourage you to take what you've uh, seen here on today and start just by doing small things because in many cases it's the small changes that motivate us to do the larger things. I think I, I share with you the client that was 62, what happened to her once she had her uh, small bits and pieces of her makeover uh, about, I guess it was six months later, she actually ended up losing the weight uh, because for her we wanted to just start where she was, and that's what I always recommend, start where you are. And we made some small changes, and because of the compliments that she received and because she started to feel better, then it motivated her to want to lose the weight after that. So if you'd like to learn more about what I have to offer, I've got some free stuff for you here on today. The first thing is that if you want to go to my website, www.klmsgroup.com, there is uh, a way for you to sign up for my e-zine. And no, I don't sell your name or give it to anyone else. It's simply a way for me to keep in contact with you and to share with you different um, events and promotions that I have during the month. So sometimes I may feature a certain aspect of image and style. And so if you'd like to keep up to date uh, with what I'm doing, feel free to go and sign up for my e-zine. You will also get a and a report called How to Project Your Best Image for Social Media and Business Headshots. When you do that, um, I'm really, really big on coaching people through the photos that they put out on their LinkedIn profile. Um, for those of you, I hope you are using LinkedIn as a way to um, sort of network and also to conduct your job searches. But uh, this really will help you be able to take a very powerful headshot. So www.klmsgroup.com. And also, when you do that, when you go on my website to sign up for the e-zine, um, I am going to have a drawing for four slots for free 30-minute virtual image audits. Um, they're valued at $125. And the way it works is, you will, once you sign up for the e-zine, we use a software that puts you into a raffle, and we're going to draw four names. I will email you to let you know um, who you are, the winners, and what you do is you upload at least, or up to rather, four photos, and of those four photos, three should be full length and one should be a um, headshot. And what you probably want to do is if you're in the market, if you're doing some job search, you may want to do one with a suit on. Maybe it's even your interview suit or whatever it is that you'd like to get some feedback on. These are the photos that you want to upload. You want to make sure that they're recent photos, by the way, as well. Uh, photos that are outdated don't uh, yield the best results. But once you sign up for the e-zine, you'll get put into that uh, drawing for the raffle and the four Slots are on next Tuesday, a week from today, October 26th, from 5 to 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So again, some of you are probably Eastern or Central, but just remember Pacific Standard Time. But you'll get a reminder telling you if you are one of the winners, okay? And at this time, I will entertain questions and answers. Um, for those of you, if you want to purchase a uh, virtual image audit, you can do that. At, uh, there's a different site. It's called book.klimagegroup.com. That's where you go to book a virtual image audit if you are not one of the ones that win one. Um, the $99 pricing is specifically for um, IV exec um, members only. Okay. 
so anyway, Mimi, at this time, I would love to entertain any questions um, that may be out there waiting for me. Yes, we actually have quite a number of questions, so we'll try to get <laughs> okay. through as many as possible. Um, okay. So the first question is, if your office permits jeans, how can you wear them best? You should wear a dark wash. That's number one. Uh, make sure, of course, they're not wrinkled or torn. I also like to do, there, I'm not sure if that's a male or a female asking, but for women, there are some uh, denim style styles that are actually made like um, trousers. They're, they're like trouser jeans is what I would call them. And uh, as a matter of fact, let me see if I have a picture of one of those. No, I don't. I thought I had one tagging on there. Sorry about that. But you want a dark wash and you definitely want something that's more of a trouser feel to it. Make sure it fits on the waist. There, It's not sagging, but wash is very important. The light, light wash is much more casual and much more of a weekend feel to it. Um, going along the lines of jeans, if casual um, dress is basically the norm in your workplace and you decide to dress a little bit better and your coworkers make fun of you, how should you handle that? Oh, I love this question. Yes, yes, I love this because there is huge peer pressure to dressing up. But I have to be honest with you, what I've found in the long term is if you do it the right way, you have to dress just slightly above what your peers are doing. So of course, if they're in jeans and, you know, a uh, rugby shirt, you don't want to be suited. You just want to be a notch above that. You want to wear slacks and a, and, a, and a nice shirt, right? And definitely not a tie if they're all the way down to base level. But my point is this. I find that over time, people sort of start to respect you for it. Um, I think if you do it in a way and you share with people, you know, you tell people that this is what I need to do for me. You know, hey, look, I just feel better when I dress this way. It really helps me be more productive, and this is what I need to do to um, be su successful in my day. I feel that people really start to respect you for it, but I do understand there is great peer pressure in dressing up, but you do have to be strong and, and uh, stand your ground, remembering what your goals are. Everybody doesn't have the same goals you do. And so you should never allow yourself to succumb to their standards because of that pressure. You have to remember where you're going. And you always want to dress for the job that you are aiming for. I know that we covered men's collars and jackets before. But what about for women? Should women's collars go inside or outside the jacket? Oh, women's collars. Okay, the mm -hmm. shirt tails. Um, women's collars, you can wear, it, it really, in most cases, you typically wear them on the outside. There are a couple of more stylish jackets that will require you to wear it on the inside, but traditionally it is worn on the outside. For men. So again, so, so again oh, just to reiterate, that would be, I'd need to have some photos to kind of show you um, some looks of some jackets where it's a good fit for wearing it on the inside. But that's more of a, a style trend than more of, a, of the traditional business look. For men, what are your thoughts on high quality sports coats rather than a blazer? And this would be a tailor jacket with a pattern. There is absolutely nothing wrong with a high-quality sports coat. Sports coats are, are just as uh, effective, um, particularly for business casual or business appropriate, as a blazer is. The challenge with the sports coat is picking a print um, or a texture that doesn't outdate you. You, you want to make sure that you get something that's still fairly updated, um, you know, stay with sort of single-breasted, you don't want a lot of pockets. You know, when you start to get in some of the tweed fabrics, you probably want to stay away from, you know, some of the, the prints or, or um, patterns that look a little bit outdated. I think that's the biggest challenge with the sports coat. But uh, in terms of it being a power tool or it being effective, yes, it's just as effective as a blazer is, yes. 
Beyond subtle shirt patterns, what are good accent pieces for men to wear when wearing light neutrals and networking? Great accent pieces for men networking. Was that the question? Yes. Okay. And when they're wearing light neutral colors okay. in general. Men, here's the deal. For men, you don't really have a lot of choices in terms of uh, styles and accessorizing. I mean, there are things that you can do making sure that you have on a really nice watch, uh, making sure that... Uh, you know your jewelry is nice and clean, and you're not even you're not even doing a lot of jewelry. You pretty much just have on your wedding band or something of that nature. But the point is, is that for men, it's all a, accessorizing is pretty much through color. So you're going to do that through a colored shirt or through the tie. Um, and when I say color, I, I want to be clear that I'm I'm not talking about you know just really loud, vibrant colors per se, but the soft pastels, they're great for men in terms of networking and depending on your audience, um, if you understand the meaning of certain colors, it really does work to sort of um, maneuver relative to, to the color shirt that you're wearing relative to the audience that you're working with as well. Remember I talked about those soft pastels for working with women, um, also for example, blue, the baby blue is great. It speaks reliability. Um, it speaks trustworthiness. So baby blue is great for that. But for men, pretty much accessorizing comes through the tie and the color of the shirt. Could you define smart casual? <laughs> smart casual, you know, it, it depends on, I'm not sure where, where you're, I guess it depends on the source where you're getting it from relative to what tiers that they have. But generally, when people say smart casual, it's usually just another way of saying business casual, meaning, uh, well, uh, how do I say this? Um, you know, Many of us use different terminology in the way that we express things. So, for example, some people used relaxed casual relative to smart casual versus um, traditional business. There's all tons of sorts of names out there. But usually when people say smart casual, what they're trying to get you to do is not come casual. They don't want you to show up in jeans and T-shirts and um, you know, just basic dockers and things like that. They want you to be a notch up from that. And uh, I would consider that to be probably more so true business casual. So no denim, uh, no casual, no weekend looking stuff. And what would be the appropriate heel height for someone who is on the shorter side or just in general? Oh, usually I say about a two and a half inch heel is, you know, if, if you're comfortable in that, but two and a half inch is appropriate. If you're someone that has a challenge with walking in heels, um, you probably want to stay at an inch, an inch and a half, but two and a half inch is, is totally okay. All right. Well, unfortunately, we had so many questions that we couldn't get to all of them, but to those of you who we didn't get to your questions, I would really encourage you to reach out to Kale and she would be more than happy to answer your questions. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, we will be sending a follow-up email uh, and I'll have all of Kale's contact information and so if you would like to inquire about her consulting services, you will have her information then. And we'll and also provide Oh, I'm sorry. We will also provide a link to stream a replay of this webinar. And just one more reminder, thank you, Mimi, that if they want to register for the drawing for the free virtual image audits, they can go to www.klimagegroup.com and sign up for the e-zine, and that's how they'll get put into that pool to register. Both men and women are welcome. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mimi.